Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the talk. It is fantastic to be speaking at the KubeCon once again in front of the awesome audience. My name is Nando Kumar Venkarachalam. I'm a senior principal engineer at Yahoo. Today, I have my colleague Pail Patel with me. Over the past 17 and a half years, I have had the incredible opportunity to work on various projects at Yahoo. One of the groundbreaking projects that particularly exciting is the work we did with the Kubernetes. Today, we're thrilled to share our platform journey with all of you. Here's the quick agenda for the talk. We'll be talking about the user interface, um, on-prem adventures, and the digital transformation journey. Let me share some quick history of how it all started and the challenges inspired us to build this platform. Looking at the tech landscape of 2016, especially most of our deployments were in bare metal. It took a long time to launch a new product, especially it involved capital expenditure and took a long time to set up application infrastructure. There were a lot of duplications. There were efforts to containerize the workload, specifically finding the right container orchestration platform. There were Mesos and Kubernetes. And you know, Kubernetes stood out for the simplicity. Building on to the success with the Kubernetes, it was very clear that Yahoo needed a robust and scalable infrastructure to host its vast array of services. It's not just the Kubernetes simplicity, its portability would allow one to deploy to multiple clouds, including on-prem. So this versatility laid the foundation for our platform team, which we named Omega. I know, it sounds crazy. It's a precursor to the Kubernetes. So we have core principles that led success to our platform team. It's one team focused everything on Kubernetes, solve common problems affecting many teams. We built lightweight set of tools and templates to make it straightforward for someone to deploy application onto the Kubernetes. By means, we take care of commonalities of the use cases, things like application identity and the security and the networking, whatnot. One of the key aspects of our platform is that the full Kubernetes interface is still available to the users. This is to empower the advanced users to make use of full of the Kubernetes ecosystem. We heard a lot about the abstraction, but we believe that abstraction helps eliminate the complexity. Especially in 2016, we didn't want to let thousands of developers to figure out how to deploy onto the Kubernetes. It was pretty new at that time. So our team created this omega.yaml it is an opinionated way to deploy containerized workload onto any Kubernetes cluster. It helps developers to focus on the code rather than the infrastructure. So here's the sample omega.yaml on your left-hand side where user would input very few inputs about the deployments, what template to use and which cluster to deploy onto. We had a screwdriver, which is a CI-CD engine, would build the code and our Omega template will build a container image out of it and create the versioned Kubernetes manifest and upload them to the artifactory. And it will deploy to the Kubernetes cluster of your choice. It could be on-prem or it could be cloud. The templates here are the simple, simple uh, Helm templates, which helps to standardize the deployments. For example, it helps you to add any sidecars to the um, your deployment, and tuning the resources. So for example, if you can tune, change the sidecar version, example Splunk, or a container resource CPU or memory, it would get deployed to all the applications when they redeploy. So we also have customized IO, which is available for the advanced users who wants to add extra sauce to their deployment template. But one can imagine without standard tool, which we have seen in the most of the other talks, like Argo helps to solve, you can say that there are at least 20 plus YAML files and multiple complex steps to get the application deployed. That's a lot of duplication. That's exactly our team tapped on from the day one. I would say this is the day of Helm Teller when before even the Helm was um, 
v1. So now that we completely mask the complexity of deployment pattern and giving abstraction to the users, we will see how we tackled some of the on-prem complexity. Networking is something special to me. Um, coming from the bare metal world, we wanted to provide every pod a native routing, be part of the on-prem network. So we worked with the network experts at Yahoo to advertise the pod subnet to the rack, which is your switch, using a well-known BGP protocol. This simplified architecture helped us to expand as needed without worrying about the IP exhaustion, yet provide meaningful functionality like public IP to the pod, any cast routing for load balancer use cases. And we had even explored uh, dual networking as well. Here's the typical Kubernetes in architecture. On your left-hand side where you see the control plane, and the authentication to the control plane, we run dedicated machines for them. The authentication to the control plane is hooked up with our, our Athens webhook, which is our internal identity on our back system, it's also no open source. So it's either screwdriver or user would provide the Athens credentials to get authenticated to the Kubernetes cluster. For ingress, it was started with the ATS, plugin directly routing to the Kubernetes parts. Later when we used Istio, it was complete stepping stone into the application security and also provided advanced routing features like service mesh. As we continue to modernize our node component, migrating from RHEL 7 to RHEL 8, we were able to bring in Cilium to provide advanced layer 4 load balancer for certain use cases. We also are able to migrate from Docker to Container D, move away from QB proxy to Cilium based um, CNI. This, uh, yeah, th this is our complete platform offering. We feel that Kubernetes serves as the foundation for building the Kubernetes uh, cloud native ecosystem. For example, we were able to offer using uh, um, dynamic volume provisioning using the CSI drivers like PowerFlex and the Trident, and that pushed the capabilities of running the um, stateful set workload. For example, our team wrote operators for deploying complex stateful set applications like Apache Storm and Redis Operator. We were also able to leverage the open source StreamZ to provide Kafka cluster provisioning. These numbers speaks for our scale. As you can see, we have 37 Kubernetes clusters as of today in the on-prem. There are 1,500 Omega YAML applications deployed through our interface. And on a day daily average basis, we see 1.8 million RPS at our Istio Ingress Gateway. So that's, that's pretty much our on-prem story. But at 2023, Yahoo finalized to move to the uh, public cloud infrastructure by transforming our on-premises infrastructure into the cloud. A lot of working groups have formed to provide happy path recommendation, specifically for account management and network management. And our team was challenged to provide the Kubernetes infrastructure on the public cloud. And we accepted the challenge. And given that we managed the vast, huge amount of on-prem clusters, we had a good idea how this would pan out in the cloud. But well, we wanted to make sure that we do the things right from the beginning, which means we had many product groups. We wanted a separate account and a separate Kubernetes cluster instead of a gigantic Kubernetes cluster we managed in on-prem. This would help us to take care of cost allocation uh, from the beginning and also helps with ease of the maintenance. We know that cloud would provide uh, APA for managing the underlying infrastructure for provisioning the nodes, including the managed control plane. We want to leverage that. But it also thrown us some of the challenges with respect to the network and how you secure your API and also the applications. This is, again, like if you can see that this is our cloud Kubernetes architecture, it's much more simplified. On the left-hand side, you see the managed control plane. We were able to tap onto the Athens OIDC, which is our uh, uh, which is our internal RBAC system. And we built a tool called kubectl CTX. Um, it's not the open source version of CTX, but this added a source to connect to the private control plane by means of connecting to the 
through the SSM bastion in case of AWS or GCP identity aware proxy for GCP. So it can create a tunnel to your private endpoint. So the, the screwdriver or, um, or the kubectl from your Mac would pass in the Athens credential, then Kubernetes, you can get authenticated to the Kubernetes control plane. We were able to lift and shift the Istio into the cloud, which would even further add more sophisticated use cases in the cloud, which I think Pyle would also be talking about. As you can see, the, the node component got much more simpler. We make use of VPC native CNI and whatnot. But wait, um, we can't just get started. We need to make sure we provision the networking in the cloud. Wearing the platform head, we wanted to make sure we centralize the VPC infrastructure. So we came up with a set of design principles how we can manage the VPC infrastructure for entire Yahoo. So uh, we created uh, Terraform modules to make sure that every team uses or every VPC uses the same AZ ID so that we can avoid the cross AZ charges wherever applicable and build common set of modules for VPC peering and, and the endpoint, endpoint creation use cases. The shared VPC architecture, as you see here, fits right, right into our model of our design principle. On the leftmost side where you see your network account, where that's where your, all the VPC creation subnet management happens. So a lot of the participant accounts can just join the VPC and make use of your VPC to create the clusters. For example, Omega would create the Omega Kubernetes clusters, either EKS, um, and, the, and the application team can make use of it to create Elastic Cache and DynamoDB, whatnot. And the one interesting piece you can see here, the last subnet, which is a private subnet for dedicated to the pod. By leveraging the separate CIDR range for your pod IP, you can expand, you can scale your Kubernetes workload without bothering about primary CIDR for the nodes. So we also wanted to make sure the enable the prefix delegation, which basically allocate slash 28 IPs, uh, slash 28 range to your pod ENI, which speeds up to your pod IP allocation. So it's actually your pod comes up much faster than not doing so. It also helps you to, if you're in AWS lane, you heard a term called NMU. It helps you to you know, reduce your pod um, NMU by 16x, like because you, you assign one EN, one slash 28 prefix instead of assi assigning one IP for every part. Yeah, so you can see that if you, the, it, of course, you know, this is not the end of the world. You can always add more ciders to your secondary range and keep expanding your part IP. So that's, that's exactly why we want to leverage a separate cider. And we also recommend creating a separate service IP range or consistent service IP range for all the clusters you have. This is the typical shared VPC architecture for GCP. Um, we, we can see that we manage the similar infrastructure in AWS and similar infrastructure in GCP. The only caveat here is that we wanted to make sure we want to create a separate VPC per region rather than utilizing the global VPC in the GCP. So just to avoid the blast radius. There are a few caveats, but GC GKE by default gives you a layer's IP range. Um, so when you, need, you may need to consider tuning your max parts, otherwise you would be unnecessarily wasting your IPs. Um, we also uh, realized that the service ciders used for GKE needs to be part of your secondary cider range. So um, we, we didn't want to waste those service cider range, but especially in cloud, EKS or GKE, once you create your cluster with a cider range for service cider, you cannot change it. So you may have to recreate your cluster. So that's why I would always recommend creating a slash 16 for your cider cider range. And you can always remove from your secondary cider range of your subnet so that you can move on. Yeah, now I'll hand it over to Pyle. We'll talk about some of the tools and the operators we have. Thank you, Nanda. I am Pyle Patel. I'm a principal engineer at Yahoo. Uh, I work for core infrastructure team at Yahoo, where I mainly focus on creating and managing this Kubernetes infrastructure at Yahoo. So now that we, have, we know about the overall ecosystem of Omega on Kubernetes, Let's talk about how do we create and manage this infrastructure. 
So when we started our journey at almost a decade ago for on-prem, we had a tool called Ansible, which helped us to create these multiple Kubernetes clusters at scale on-prem. And when we started early in 2021, we needed a similar tool which we can leverage in order to create a similar infrastructure in GKE as well as AWS. We had an internally developed tool called Flex, which was mainly built in using Ruby. It used cloud formation under the hood in order to create and manage resources in the cloud. And however, it only supported the use case for AWS EKS. Starting 2023, uh, my team started building a new tool called Cadence which is built using Golang. It is using Terraform under the hood in order to create and manage your resources in cloud. And as of this year, it also supports EKS. The reason for adding this EKS support into Cadence is that we wanted to leverage a single tool which you can use to form the multiple Kubernetes cluster across the multiple uh, cloud environment, and the experience should be seamless. So while we were building these tools, there were some of the requirements which we came across. Of course, as Nanda mentioned, one of the prerequisites for us was that it assumes that your underlying networking layer is already laid out, meaning that your VPC and subnets are already pre-created. Along with that, there were top most three requirements which we uh, try to in include into our tools. The first and foremost is that the interface should be very simple, meaning that it can be in the form of a unit of a file or a YAML file, which any user can just simply provide their cluster metadata and they can form their cluster in a matter of minutes without even touching the underlying Terraform or cloud formation. The second requirement which we came across is that while we use this tool, of course, you can create and use this tool to form the Kubernetes cluster live straight from your desktop. But we also want to integrate the CI-CD automation. So tool should also support that. Where you are using any headless user or CI-CD, you should be able to maintain your Kubernetes cluster using CI-CD automation as well. Last but not the least is that while this tool supports the creation of the vanilla Kubernetes cluster, it should also provide an ability to a user to decorate your Kubernetes cluster with the custom plugin and add-ons. Meaning that if there is a requirement for any cluster where you need to install any specific plugins and add-ons, the interface should be the exactly same which they are use, using in order to create their Kubernetes cluster. So here is an example for our tool called Flex. As you can see that it is a pretty simple YAML interface on the uh, left hand side, top, uh, top left hand side, you can see that it contains the cluster metadata information along with the Kubernetes version. On the bottom left, it contains uh, your networking uh, information in terms of VPC and subnets. On the left hand side, you can see it has a configuration for core add ons, and on top of that, it has a custom add on as well. So, as you can see, that it's a pretty simple YAML interface, and your cluster should be up in a matter of minutes, be it a CI CD or you are driving straight from your desktop. And here is our new interface phase for the Cadence. As you can see that it is pretty simple uh, interface where you can simply provide cluster metadata, your node group information, and you can create your GKE cluster. And as you can see that, the interface is no different than GKE. As I mentioned earlier that we have added the support for, um, sorry, uh, EKS into the Cadence as well. So all in all, the experience is very seamless. And you don't even have to touch base with the Terraform or the cloud formation while you are using these tools. So now that we discussed about uh, overall cluster formation and, the ma uh, and uh, what about the maintenance? Before I go into the maintenance for the cloud, I want to touch base on some of the cluster maintenance details which we embarked on to the, our on-prem journey. Whenever there was a need for us in order to upgrade Kubernetes version on-prem, the first and foremost thing my team did is to review the chain log summary look for any breaking changes. If there are, there are any breaking changes, we will prepare for the release before we lay out for the mass Kubernetes version upgrade. As Nanda mentioned earlier, we have the presence in a seven regions on-prem, and which contains about 8,000 plus physical host. So doing this Kubernetes version upgrade with live workload running on it, it's a, going to be a tedious process. Along with that, it used to take us a month in order to complete this upgrade due to the physical host nature of our on-prem. In order to solve that problem, my team built an operator called a node manager, which helps us to automate this entire process where you can simply perform the Kubernetes version upgrade, uh, upgrade in a controlled manner where it can ensure that your cluster capacity is maintained. If there are any failure or error rate, it will pause the upgrade. Uh, along with that, it will ensure that it is not impacting the live workload running onto your, onto your workload, worker nodes. 
So as you can see, while we are doing this, using this tool, we could now finish our Kubernetes version upgrade from months to weeks because automation is in place and now you don't need to worry about it, about the failure rate or error rate while the upgrade is going on. Along with that, we also combined our Node-OS upgrade with our Kubernetes version upgrade so that we can save the tons of time. How do we do that in cloud? Well, that's the advantage of using a managed Kubernetes service in cloud because it gives you out-of-the-box support for the automated Kubernetes version upgrade. It ensures that uh, your cluster capacity is maintained automatically. Along with that, due to the elastic nature of your compute resource, you don't have to um, you know, drain your node, perform the upgrade, validate the upgrade, and put back in, into a ready state, which is the case of on-prem for us. So it is really fast and smooth. Earlier, you must have noticed that I mentioned that we are using a specific Kubernetes version uh, into our configuration file. The reason for is that uh, we are using STO uh, throughout into our ecosystem of Omega. And we wanted to ensure that we are using the correct version, which is supported by STO as well. So that's the reason they both should go hand in hand. However, one of the caveats we came across with the GK uh, infrastructure is that if you are pinning specific version of Kubernetes, and if that specific version is getting EOL'd, GK will move on with the upgrade anyway. So now that we talked about cluster management, how about the cluster monitoring? How do we ensure that after I build and form my cluster, it, the cluster state is uh, stable at any given time? Along with that, it should also ensure that my workloads running on these clusters are also stable enough. How do I ensure that I can get notified in the case of any significant events? We leverage the open source tool called Prometheus, which helps us to store the metrics use Alert Manager, which can help us to alert on a significant event, use uh, uh, Prometheus to visualize these metrics over time. Since we had a presence in a seven different regions, we also leveraged the Prometheus Federation solution to visualize all of these metrics into a single span of view. Along with that, we also use a Splunk at Yahoo, which we, where we can log on to a significant event and, and potentially alert on that as well. How do we do that in cloud? We leverage the same similar tools, tool, tool set into the cloud as well. One of the things which we also leverage when we move to GKE is that we leveraged uh, out of the box solution for the observability where we can trace the specific application events uh, and we can uh, alert uh, based on that. So now that we talk enough about the cluster maintenance, how about the App security, how about the user which gets onboarded to our Kubernetes infrastructure? The first and foremost thing when any user uh, onboard to our Kubernetes infrastructure is they create a service into our Athensi UI. For those who don't know about the Athensi, it's an open source tool you can check out in our GitHub repo, which provides as a service identity. The first thing you do is, as a user, is that you will go to Athensi UI, you create a service. Along with that, you will create the IAM role for your given service. With using IRS token, as you can see in this diagram, using a CR container, which is responsible for giving you XY9 uh, certificate for your pod or a service. All in all, at the end of this entire operation, you get your pod identity in form of XY9 certificate. How do you do that in GKE? As you can see that it's no different than EKS, except that we are using the um, IAM service account in case of GKE. Here is an example which, uh, uh, mentions that how our user onboards. Our user simply uses these three lines of Terraform code where it will set up their whole environment in terms of creating their service into Athensi UI, form the IAM role, and at the end of the day, they, their entire infrastructure is already set up. So let's talk about service to service communication. Now my power got this identity. How do I use this identity to communicate from one service to another service? Well, everybody here in the room knows that there comes the service mesh. As you can see in this diagram, whenever any request comes from the external world, it will come through the S2O ingress gateway, it will tunnel through that, it will land into the S2O sidecar proxy. Each and every pod into a Kubernetes ecosystem has a S2O sidecar proxy attached with it. And for example, in this diagram, as you can see, if service A wants to communicate to a service B, they can talk to each other via STO sidecar proxy, meaning that they can talk to each other through M MTLS using X509 certificate, and the traffic retains within the cluster. So meaning that the traffic doesn't need to get out of the cluster to communicate to a service B, 
all in all, you can save the network cost because your traffic retains within the mesh. Another advantage of using S2 Ingress Gateway is that you can, uh, it retains the traffic wind into the same AZ, meaning that many of you must have heard the term locality-based routing, where if you have a service into a specific already zone, and if your target service also is retaining in the same zone, it will retain the traffic wind to the same AZ. Again, you can save the cost at the cross AZ level here using the service mesh. So now my user created a service, it has its own identity, it can communicate, and along with that, they also provide the authorization policy for that service, meaning that they define what service can talk to my service, on what resources, and on what path. We converge this authorization policy into an STO authorization policy at the Kubernetes cluster level. So anytime any communication happens between service A to service B, uh, our infrastructure ensures that it adheres to that STO authorization policy. So now we talked about, okay, we take care of the layer seven. How about layer four? There comes a network policy. What is a network policy? It's just a specification for a pod or a service to communicate at a network level, meaning that you can control the traffic at the port or the IP level. When we started our journey um, into cloud, we initially leveraged the AWS EPC CNI solution, which helps us to implement network policy solution into cloud. However, some of our services contain the dot into the name, and due to that, AWS UPC CNI was crashing for us. In order to move on with our migration, my team leveraged the Cilium CNI solution in AWS to implement the network policy solution. So while I uh, reach towards the end, I want to share some of the key takeaways which can be applicable to somebody who is learning their workload on-prem, on or starting their journey into the cloud, or they are just migrating from on-prem to a cloud. The first and foremost is the power of platform engineering. Well, giving an abstraction layer to our users or our customers really helps them to focus on their application, meaning that our application user can simply focus on building and developing their code, come into the GitHub, and my team will take care of from coming to production. They don't even need to touch base with the underlying infrastructure at all. That means they are totally privileged to just focus on their application, and they don't need to worry about anything else. Tools like Cadence, which can really help us to standardize this cluster creation process across the fleet, be it in a multi-cloud, and as a user, you don't even have to touch base with the Terraform or the cloud formations. Bin packing. For those in the clouds, uh, we always want to measure, ensure that we are using the si right sizing of the nodes, meaning that you want to leverage the full utilization of your CPU and memory in order to save some cost. Using of service mesh and locality based routing, as I mentioned earlier, it can help you to save the network cost at the NLB layer as well as the cross AZ layer. In terms, of, uh, in terms of cluster security, using a tools like OPA, which can really help us to ensure that only the resource can get admitted to our Kubernetes ecosystem, which are adhering to our admission policies. Tools like KubeBench can help us to make sure that we are adhering to our CSI benchmarking uh, security and compliance rules. Tools like Image Policy Webhook in the case of on-prem for us and ensures that only signed Docker images are getting entered into our Kubernetes ecosystem, and many more. Combining an upgrade uh, in case of on-prem along with the Node.js version and Kubernetes version upgrade really helps us to save time when your scale is really large. Last but not the least is that having the well-architected reviews, meaning that ensuring that your, secure, your cluster security posture is maintained at any given time, along with that ensuring that your application running on this Kubernetes infrastructure is also adhering to a security and compliance at, uh, overall. So as of this, uh, as of today, we have about 40 plus Kubernetes cluster running into our multi-cloud. We just successfully launched our header builder pre-build project, which is serving about 50K RPS. And it, using that, our, that team sold about one third of their cost. What is next for us? Well, 2025 is all about the migration for us. We want to migrate as many applications as we can from the on-prem to the multi-cloud environment. And probably, who knows, we'll come back next year and share our stories. So with that, I want to thank you, my team. Without them, this entire journey wouldn't have, have been possible. Thank you for joining into this session. If you have any feedback for us, please scan this QR code, and uh, we are, I'm opening the floor for any questions you may have.
Hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering, when you do automatic upgrades of the Kates version, how do you handle deprecations of manifest files? Like HPA recently got deprecated, or it, the version got upgraded. So how do you handle that automatically? That's where our templating would come in. So not every user need to figure out what HPA version. Like we have come through a crazy ages of from 2016, where we have seen V1 beta one finally uh, got the HPA V1. Yeah. yeah. So we upgrade the template, and and the good thing about the Kubernetes is that you have the version compatibility um, before they deprecate it. So we follow up our users. We change the template and promote it and let the user redeploy it to get the changes. So yeah, it is an active follow-up with the users, yeah. So is there an automatic process for that, or do you manually, after every release, go through the docs and make those changes manually? Right now, it's a manual screening, yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you. So. I, it sounds like Cadence was an internally developed tool, uh, Yahoo specific. Do you have any recommendations for similar tools that might be available in the open source environment? So there are multiple tools which we found which were available in the open source. However, when we came across the, you know, over the research, end of the research, we couldn't find any specific tool which can help us and also add to our internal ecosystem. For example, we had a certain integration where we are following some internal tools for setting up the bash and host. We are using some internal tools which we can use to set up some pre-infrastructure level. So we had that challenge when we started, you know, considering that, okay, we want to build our own tool. Another reason for uh, like there, when we started about 2018 earlier, we use a flex. At that time, there are not many tools were available. So based on our learning from the flex, we thought, okay, we need to revamp this tool. We want to use Golang instead of Ruby, and you know, which can help us to create the cluster in a way of which we want. Thank you so much. Excellent presentation. Um, I have two questions. Uh, first question, I'm not sure if I missed this, but I'm just curious why you guys have both GK and EKS clusters. Um, and second question is, I'm wondering if you're able to talk more about the internals of Node Manager, like how it facilitates cluster upgrades and like how you validate test um, the upgrades. What was the first question? Uh, I'm not sure I heard the first question. Can you question repeat your first question? Oh, yes. The first question is, why do you have both GKE and EKS clusters? Why do we have both GK and EKE clusters? Well, when we started this journey, some of our application workloads, which wants to use some of the managed service from the GKE, which are not presently available in AWS, A, of course, there are a lot of cost aspect when you are acquiring any of the cloud between AWS or GKE. That was the one reason. Uh, so that's the reason. Based on the use case, we had to pick one cloud out of the two. What was your second question? Um, are you able to share more about the internals of Node Manager, how it helps cluster upgrades, and how you do testing and validation? Yes. So when we wrote this Node Manager, it's it's nothing but the Kubernetes operator. It's a CRD base. You create your uh, custom resource with the configurations. It contains a bunch of node groups with its respective th failure threshold. So we also have multi different category of our node groups. So it's a entirely all in a controller. Along with that, you can mount your Kubernetes version steps into that, or you can provide as a config mag, which can go and run across on each and every Kubernetes node. And how do you validate? Along with that Kubernetes version upgrade, we also have injected the validation step along with it. So it goes into like a phased manner for where you can see in a typical controller world, where you can say that it's a dispatch, it's in progress. From that, it can go to either failure or it can go to the complete state after the validation. And it also adds a retry and all. So all in all, just a node manager and control. I'm happy to talk to you offline if you need more information. All right, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.